<laughs> Happy Easter again, everybody. Um, let's dive right in. Would you pray after me five words? Lord Jesus, speak to me. Amen. <laughs> For the past month, we've been in a series called Against All Odds. And the series was based on this incredible chapter in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 53. The prophet Isaiah recorded his predictions, listen to me, 700 years before Jesus was born. So please, let this, don't just hear the words. 700 years before he was born with incredible accuracy. He describes 24 actions the Messiah would experience and fulfill, and this was all fulfilled during Holy Week, which is what we just celebrated. We started on Good Friday around the artwork, and here we are today. But actually, it started every week, every day of the week, something was happening. But he predicted that the Messiah would be despised, rejected, and betrayed. That's incredible accuracy right there. He said he'd be silent facing his accusers, another mind blower. He would bear our sorrows and sins. By bearing our sins, he would heal our souls. When it says heals your diseases, he meant the diseases of our soul. By bearing our sins, he would pay the price for our redemption. And then Isaiah predicted he'd be successful. That's an understatement with over two billion followers a couple of thousand years later. And that he would rise from the dead. Come on, that's 700 years before. The reason we call the series Against All Odds is because several years ago, a mathematician named Dr. Peter Stoner did some work with the probability theory. He sat to determine the odds for any one person fulfilling eight prophecies of scripture. Stoner said, it should be on the screen, the chance that any man might have lived, please don't get ahead of me, that have lived down to the present time, fulfilled eight prophecies is one to the 10th power. That number looks like one with 17 zeros behind it. It is 100 quintillion. That's, <laughs> it's kind of hard to grasp. So Sona illustrated it like this. I'll read it. You've heard me say it before. Suppose we take 10, one and 10th power, well, 100 quintillion silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. They will cover all of the state two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars. Stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state blindfold a man, tell him that he could travel as far as he wishes, but he has to pick up that one silver dollar and say, this is the right one. What chance would he have of getting that right one? One in the 10th power. Now, that's eight prophecies. What are the chances that anyone could fulfill 48 prophecies of scripture? The number's so big, we don't have a name for it. And in his life, he not only fulfilled 48 prophecies, in death, he fulfilled, listen, 332 prophecies in his life. You know, what are the odds? I mean, they're completely impossible. And I have the 48 if you ever want to look at them. Today being Easter, I'm not going to run you through 48 prophecies. We're going to concentrate on the one big major one, Jesus' resurrection from the dead. What are the odds that a dead person can come back from the grave? It's been done a few times, not from the grave, mostly in an emergency room on an operating table right? Or trapped under the icy water and they kind of do the freeze thing and they were revived or resuscitated. Jesus wasn't revived or resuscitated. He was resurrected. There's a meme on the screen there. He was resurrected, brought back after three days, body decomposing the whole bit. What are the odds that someone who was crucified and pronounced dead by a professional Roman executioner, and they were good at what they did, he had a spear thrust through his side, up through his rib cage, into his heart. That clear fluid came out, stating that the heart walls collapsed. His body was pried off nails from a cross. He's wrapped in 200 pounds of spices, which cover his mouth, nose, everything, his face. And then the 2,000-pound stone is rolled over the tomb. What are the odds that he wakes up? Ooh, what's going on? Rolls the stone away and walks 14 miles that day. Seven one way, seven another way, and then convinces his friend, hey, guys, I'm better. I mean, come on. It's zero, right? Totally zero. Jesus' resurrection was against all odds. So we make a big deal out of Easter because Easter is a big deal. It's a really big deal. He came back to life. I mean, come on. Proves God is all powerful. He demonstrates that Jesus was and is who he said he was and that there's really life after death. How comforting is that for all of us? In Isaiah 53:10 on the screen, 
but it was the Lord's good plan to bruise him and fill him with grief. Well, that was Good Friday. What's next? However, when his soul had been made an offering for sin, that happened on the cross. Next. Then he shall have a multitude of children and many heirs. That's you and I. That's all of us, right? What's next? Then he shall live again. There's your res- This is today. This is the resurrection. Next. No. The other way. And God's program shall prosper in his hands. Uh, God's program is the church. And a couple of thousand years later, like I said, there's branches in all parts of the world. So now we go to verse 11. And he says, remember, this is all 700 years prior. When he sees all that is accomplished by the anguish of his soul, he shall be satisfied. And because of what he has experienced, my righteous servant shall make many to be counted righteous before God, for he shall bear all their sins. So we, he who knew no sin became sin, so we might become the righteousness in him. So we're all righteous before God because of what Jesus did. What are the odds that that could happen, would happen, and did happen? So I just want to walk you through the story today, and I hope when we leave, we have a little more of an understanding of what happened on Easter Sunday, other than, okay, Christ resurrected. All four gospel writers have it in the gospels, and I'm going to use Luke's version. Let me take a drink of water first. Did everybody have breakfast this morning? I was at a wedding. I ate things I would never eat. They had waffles and ice cream. <laughs> if you've <laughs> you ever been to the Brownstone, man, they do it upright. Um, back to the, I'm sorry. I digress. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. The reason we worship on Sunday is because Jesus rose on Sunday. They went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. They didn't get those at Bloomingdale's. So the women were terrified and they bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men, he's not here, he is risen. Remember, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying, it's necessary that the son of man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, the other women were with them, telling the apostles these things. But their words seemed like nonsense to them, and they didn't believe the women. Doesn't that get you mad, women? Come on, what do you mean? Peter, however, got up and he ran to the tomb. In another gospel, it says John beat him. (laughs) Show off. When he stooped to look in, he saw only linen clothes. So he went away amazed at what had happened. Okay, so what do we know so far? We have several things. Um, First, just before dawn, three women went to the tomb, at least three. And if you were fabricating an account, no offense here, ladies, but in that culture, you wouldn't have used the women because they weren't even allowed to testify in court. Women were very second-class citizens, and you've come a long way, baby, as the Virginia Slims commercial used to say. But why would you put that in there, right, if it was a a fable or you're fabricating the account? The second thing, while on the way there was an earthquake, it tells us that in Matthew. So there's a whole lot of shaking going on. There were two earthquakes in a couple of days, and earthquakes are not common in Jerusalem. They'll remember this one because it split a crack in the ground. It's still there today. When we go in July, you will see it. Third, angels announced that Jesus had risen. Angels appeared in the form of men. Matthew says that they appeared like lightning. I don't know exactly what that means, uh, but it says his clothes were as white as snow. Fourth, the women reported the news to the disciples, and on the way, they encountered Jesus in the flesh. They run into him. And of course, the men didn't believe him. The disciples didn't believe him. I mean you got to give them a little bit. You probably wouldn't have either. You know, they just saw Jesus die a horrible death on the cross, watched the Roman soldiers thrust the spear in his side, and all the the clear fluid coming out. If you're in the hospital, you know what I'm talking about. It means the heart walls collapsed. And Peter and John are intrigued enough to investigate at least and go go to the tomb. 
So what happened? This is Easter morning. Everybody's freaking out, totally freaking out. And they're, they're wondering, is this true? Is it not true? And imagine trying to process that kind of information, right? I mean, you're, it's all bewildered. And there's more. Luke tells us Easter afternoon, and this is my favorite portion of scripture. I played in a band called the Emmaus Road Band when we toured Israel, and uh, this is where we got the name from. Now, that same day, two of them are on their way to a village called Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together, they're discussing everything that had taken place. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit while I'm going into it. So while they're discussing and arguing, Jesus himself comes near and he starts walking with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. In another transit, but him they did not see. I mean, they lost all their hope and now they're walking with hope. They don't recognize hope because all their hope died on the cross. How many times when we get knocked off center, when life hits us hard, we don't recognize that God is right there with you. You don't see it. Usually later on down the road, you might say, oh, man, he was with me all along. But in the moment when it hits you, smashes your heart, you don't see him at all, do you? Then he asked them, "Uh, what are you guys talking about? What's going on? (laughs) And they stopped and they looked at him, kind of discouraged and kind of amazed. And one of them named Cleopas, let's call him Cleo. So Cleo answers him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem? Because remember, it was Passover, so everybody's visiting. And you don't know what things happen these days? And Jesus is being a little sneaky. He's like, what things? He's kind of drawing them out, right? And they said, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people. If he was a prophet, you should have listened to what he was saying. And how our chief priests and leaders, so they handed him over to be sentenced to death and crucified him. But we had hoped, we were hoping that he was the one about to redeem Israel. They didn't catch any of the part that he's going to redeem you. They, we, we were hoping that he'd overthrow the Romans and redeem Israel, and Israel gets back on track, and we put him up as king. They missed the whole thing here, right? And besides all that, it's the third day. Shouldn't you have been expecting something if it's the third day, right? Moreover, some of our women... They arrived early at the tomb and they didn't find his body and they came and reported they saw a vision of angels that said he was alive. And some of us who were, we went to the tomb and found it just like the women told us, but we didn't see him, but him they did not see. And then Jesus gets on him a little bit and he starts, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets had spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into glory? I mean, don't you remember Don't you remember the stuff I was talking to you about? Don't you remember when I said, look, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, handed over, crucified, but on the third day, I will be resurrected. Don't you remember? Come on, I told you three times. (laughs) Three times? Remember with Peter? Peter, do you love me? Why do you think I said it three times? Don't you remember? Peter, remember I told you when the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three, you're going to deny me three times. Don't you remember? Come on, don't you remember? And then here's my, I wish I was there, and I guess I will be someday. I wish I was a fly on the, sho- on the shoulder because he gives them the greatest Bible study ever. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Wow, wow. They came near the village where they were going. And here he goes being sneaky again. He gives them the impression that he's going further. But they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. You have to invite Jesus in. We've got free will. He gives you an opportunity to invite him into your heart. You can come to church every Sunday. You can tithe. And I hope you are. You can, you can tithe. You can do all the right stuff. But if you don't invite him in your heart, right, he's not going to come in. You're just going to hear me. And the words are going to bounce off you. I'm going to be boring, and maybe you'll like the band, but you got to invite him in. As it, it was as he reclined at the table, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and then gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But then he disappeared from their sight. There he goes again, right? 
He breaks the bread. It's kind of threefold there. Remember communion he did with them that quiet night, wanted to have dinner with his friends. He breaks the bread and forms a new covenant with communion. Do this in remembrance of me. It also signifies his broken body on the cross. And there's something about us that we don't see the glory of God until we're broken. I don't know what it is, but pain is God's megaphone. (laughs) You know, when we're broken, we're more apt to see the glory of God. And then again, suddenly, all of a sudden, you realize he was with you all the time, all along. Back to the scripture. They said to each other, we're not our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us. And that very hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They're walking away from Jerusalem. Seven miles. And Jesus meets them on the road. They're walking away. And Jesus had to rekindle their hearts. And, and he did it through the word of God. He did it through the scripture. We're not our hearts burning when he opened up the scriptures to us. And then all of a sudden, there's a complete turnaround. They turn the page. They're walking away from Jerusalem. Now they're going back to Jerusalem. And they're completely changed. They're, go, they're walking the whole other direction now. They were depressed, downcast, and despondent. And all of a sudden, they're leaving Emmaus, and they're going back. They lost their hope. Hope was standing right next to them. They almost missed it. Thank God they invited him in. See what I mean? It's the third day and you're leaving Jerusalem. Why not hang out to the end of the day? See what happens when you leave church early? You miss the greatest part. Come on, right? (laughs) We must act in ways that we believe and expect to be blessed and act like it. What do you need today? Do you need inner peace? Expect it. You need relief from some point of pain? Expect it. Do you need a breakthrough with one of your kids? Expect it. You have success in business? You want success in business? Expect it. And then you're going to realize that, you know what? He was with you all along. What is something that you need, something good that you need to believe for today? Pray for it and act for it. Let's go back to Luke. They found the 11 and those with them gathered. Now they're back in Jerusalem. They said, the Lord has truly been raised, man. He appeared to Simon. And then they began to describe what happened on the road. And he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. So we did the morning. Now we're in the afternoon. So Jesus reveals himself to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And then Luke continues with them because now they're back in Jerusalem. And he says, as they were saying these things, he himself, Jesus, stood in their midst. And he said to them, peace to you. He gave him their, his peace. He put his peace upon them, right? And they're startled. They're kind of terrified because they think he's a ghost. And he goes to them, what is wrong with you guys? Why, why are you all messed up? Why are you so troubled? Look at my nail-pierced hands, my feet-pierced one, sue, at, one through, and my sword-driven side. Look, I still got the wounds. Check it out. Feel, look, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones. I'm standing here right before you. Having said this, like I said, he showed them all of his wounds, right? And there's still, I mean, there's still some disbelief, but they're overjoyed too. I mean, how would you be? You'd be in shock, really, right? And then he goes, you know, it's been a rough couple of days. You guys got anything to eat? I'm hungry. And he gives them a piece of fish, and he eats it. Ghosts don't eat. This is so cool. And then then he says the same thing to them. This is what I was telling you. These are my words while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, it had to be fulfilled. Don't you remember? And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said, he gave him a little reminder. He goes, this is what was written. This is what I was telling you. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day. And repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. So that was ground zero, and then it goes out. You're my witnesses to these things. And look, I'm sending you as the Father promised. And as for you, stay in the city until you're empowered from on high, meaning the Holy Spirit. So here's the night of Easter. Jesus came to the disciples in the evening. He walked through a wall to get to them. He showed them his wounds so that they would believe and, and basically, he had their full attention. He ate something, and now he gives them a Bible study. He uses the word of God. He explains the scriptures to them from the first to the last. 
That's Luke's account of Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday was quite a big deal, wouldn't you say? It's a big day and night, 24 hours. So he rose from the dead. He met and proved himself to no less than 16 people that day, including four women, 10 apostles. Judas already split, ran off. Thomas wasn't there on the first Sunday, plus the two guys on the road to Emmaus. He walked through a wall, demonstrated what I said before, our upgraded features of our new bodies. Musicians, you can come up. That's kind of cool, isn't it? I'm putting in for that. I don't know what else we're going to be like, but man, oh man. And then he ate some fish. Here's the great part. We're going to still eat. <laughs> and we're not going to get clogged arteries. We're not going to gain any weight. We're going to have the best food in the world. Holy smokes. And he demonstrated that he was really flesh and blood, not a ghost, not an apparition. What does that mean for us? The resurrection changed absolutely everything. It means that there really is life after death, and God made a way for us to get there. It means we're not evolutionary accidents, but intentionally created sons and daughters, made in the image of God. Please. We done? Let me start that over again. Now, you know what? You blew my head. Uh, no, really, it's ridiculous. Made in the image of God, all of God's loves, hopes, and dreams with him. It means that life has meaning and purpose, and it has something better for us to look forward to, right? Jesus is already in tomorrow, and we're wondering, you know, what's behind the curtain? He's standing there saying, it's all right, I'm behind the curtain. You lost a loved one? I took the danger for you. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. My yoke's easy, my burdens are light. Come on, cast your cares upon me. Cast them like a fisherman casts a net, for I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you're going to find rest for your souls. Happy Resurrection Day, everybody. Man, I hope, I hope you get the meaning today. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He's Lord of all creation. He's the Lamb who was slain for the sins of the whole world, yours and mine, crucified, resurrected, ascended, sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he left behind us people to report what was going on. And it's still rolling. The concentric circle from Jerusalem is still going. He's the eternal son of God. He's somebody you could trust. Let him have your heart. Let him have your life. Let him have your life forever, really. Would you pray these words with me? I'll say them. You say them out loud with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from me. I want to live for you. Live your life in me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I'll serve you forever. How do you serve them? Love each other. That's it. The big one, one string on the guitar. Love, love, love. Love each other. Come on. That's it. Don't lord it over people. Don't boss people around. Don't throw pens when you, something doesn't work right. <laughs> I'm Italian. I can't help it. <laughs> now, I'm going to ask you a question. It's not a trick question. If you prayed this prayer for the first time in your life, if today you sincerely invited him in, would you just slip your hand up? I just want to be able to pray for you. Amen, 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 amen. Oh, man. Lord, thank you for coming to us. Thank you for coming for us. Thank you for being with us and suffering death on the cross for us. Thank you for loving us the way you do with all our imperfections and everything that we feel so inadequate at times, Lord. And we get scared and when life hits us hard, we don't see you. But I know you're with us all the way, walking with us. And you're just waiting for us to invite you in so you can break bread. You said, I stand at the door and knock. You stand at the door of our hearts and you knock on it. You said, if we open the door, that you and the Father will come in and fellowship with us. So this is what happened right here. We conducted eternal business on Easter Sunday. Remember the date. Write it in your journal. Write it down. It's kind of a new birth, to be honest with you. And we're not crazy. We're not militant. We preach love here. And everybody's welcome here in Jesus' name. And the church said what? Let's stand together.